And I thought I would start out with a picture of the very first thing you always get told uh, when, you, when you get into this area, uh, especially when you're, you've, you have some experience in banking regulation, is it's impossible for there to be a run on an insurance company. So I thought I would start out with a picture of a run on an insurance company. This is, um, this is AIG, Singapore subsidiary, and these people are lined up uh, to cash out their investment products with that subsidiary based on what happened uh, to another subsidiary of the company half a world away. Um, so <clears throat> what does this tell us? Well, the reason why people claim that there can't be a run on an insurance company is, of course, because I'm sure there was plenty of discussion of this in the, the first panel, uh, the conventional insurance model uh, does rely on genuinely diversified risk pooling, uh, the pooling of independent risky events that are uncorrelated with the broader financial sector, um, where clients cannot easily cash out or take back their premiums on demand based on the, uh, the condition of the insurance company, the classic example being property and casualty. I heard that example come up in the case of auto insurance in, in one of the questions uh, previously. You know, we, we don't expect everyone in the United States to have a car crash at the same time. Um, but financial guarantee and investment products offered by insurance companies are quite different. Uh, these are products that really sort of concentrate financial risk with the insurer, draw that risk to the insurer. They're not really a diversified pool of independent events. Uh, they're really, uh, they're, they're systemic risk insurance to some degree or other, depending on how the product is written. Uh, and there are these products at the institutional and fund level, and I'm sticking with products that are still common in the market. I'll work my way to AIG in a minute. But these products are all still very common and routine in the market. Uh, guaranteed investment contracts, wraps, uh, bond insurance is kind of recovering after some tough years in, uh, in the financial crisis. And then individual products. Uh, variable annuities, uh, contingent deferred annuities, lots of annuities can be cashed out early on demand and in fact based on, they, they, they probably should have that feature based on how they're sold to investors. Um, and this is just a, a quick example, there's been a lot of research coming out about the market penetration of these unconventional products, but this is just a, a quick example of the, the growth in the share of annuity versus conventional life premiums between 1980 and 2012, you could see the percentage of, uh, of total premiums coming from annuities more than doubles. And not all annuities have this feature of being able to be cashed out early, but a lot do. Um, so that's the kind of thing that drives that line that we saw in the, um, uh, th that we saw at AIG's uh, Singapore subsidiary. Uh, and then we have, uh, so not only do we have these financial guarantee products, that tie the liability side of the insurance business to financial systemic risk. Uh, we have insurers' role as asset holders. Insurers collectively own about a third of investment-grade bonds. This implies some potentially significant impact on bond prices if they are forced uh, to liquidate lots of assets in a disorderly manner. Uh, insurers hold a lot of illiquid assets. That's perfectly appropriate and, in fact, probably a good thing if it's properly aligned with their liabilities, if their liabilities are truly diversified, truly long dated, uh, not so good a thing if these, these liabilities are cash out liabilities in the event of, of systemic risk. Um, and then just, just the sheer size of the, uh, of the asset inventory held by insurance companies gives them the potential to become uh, intermediaries through a securities lending business. And we saw this with AIG, they did securities lending, they, they reinvested the proceeds from that in, in risky assets, then they, they, they couldn't get back those proceeds, um, and they were sort of intermediating between their own policyholders and uh, outside uh, entities who were, who were borrowing in the markets. Um, so some lessons of the crisis that I think have guided us in the reform community in thinking about this, AIG might be unique in the sense that I don't think that we're going to see another major global insurer offering to pick up tail risk on subprime securities by selling credit default swaps, at least I hope not, if the SEC ever finishes their rules on credit default swaps at least. Um, but the lesson of AIG is really the ease with which a large insurer was able to sort of support a financial guarantee subsidiary 
that had very large impacts across the financial system through the guarantees that it wrote. And uh, that, that's a broader lesson, and I think that lesson uh, still holds. Uh, and you could see some of the same lessons, I think, in monoline insurers and, and mortgage insurance that you had undercapitalized entities that looked very big because in good times they were able to collect a lot of premium revenue and they didn't have to pay out. Uh, they were making direct financial guarantees that allowed arbitrage and they couldn't pay off on them. So what we need is we need uh, some appropriate group level oversight to make sure this kind of thing isn't happening uh, in a subsidiary of the company. Uh, we need to prevent cases where insure financial guarantees by insurers are used to create inappropriate arbitrage of risk, uh, to, to move risk to places in the system where it's, it's undercapitalized. And I think we need to reexamine protection of policyholders because of the dependence of a lot of insurance companies on federal support during the, uh, not a lot, but a number of insurance companies on central bank support during the crisis.